Welcome everybody to another one of our SBDC pivot panels. I'm Leanne Presley. I'm a consultant with the Central Mountain SBDC here in Salida, Colorado. And my purpose with these pivot panels is to interview local businesses in Chafee Park and Lake County who have done some sort of pivot during the COVID crisis. So today, my guest is Danielle DeForest, and she is the tasting room manager over at Soulcraft Brewery here in Salida, Colorado. Uh, welcome, Danielle. Thank you very much. I'm so glad I get to do this with you. <laughs> it's going to be fun. So Danielle, let's start by just sharing a little bit with our audience about what happened at Soulcraft when, let's put a time frame on it, about kind of end of March, when you first got the word that you were gonna need to pivot and change your business operations due to the pandemic. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, obviously everyone, the immediate reaction was kind of, kind of panic. So what do we do? Um, and fortunately I had already started thinking because I knew something was gonna happen at some point uh, regarding on-premise um, and gatherings. So the weekend before, we had already moved out 50% of our tables just to make the people that were still coming in feel better. Um, we added more hand sanitizer. And again, this was the weekend of, I want to say, the 14th, 15th of March. Um, so we had started doing that. And I had started pre-planning signs with hours because I knew things were changing. All right, so once we got that definitive word for no on-premise consumption, again, we had already thought, what can we do? So we knew we could sell to go. We already have, um, we do in-house packaging of six packs. So we already have a cooler full of beer we produce and package. Um, and then we've always filled growlers and I knew that had to change with the new sanitation. We didn't want to just fill any vessel that came in like we had in the past because um, we didn't want any cross-contamination. So we put in place a little growler exchange, which is a little inconvenient to people that have um, either stainless steel growlers or growlers from other locations, because the whole concept is you come in, you drop yours off. We get a big stack of them, I bring them out back, um, and then disinfect and sanitize. So everything is done to a certain standard, so that essentially when you come in to get a new one, it is new and ready and clean, and there's no question about what's happening. So. We kind of implemented that um, in the beginning and then the six packs and then we just moved everything toward the door. So we had a one in, one out, POS, everything. We tried to, if the weather was decent, both doors were open, get people as close. Um, we decided it wasn't in our best interest to do delivery. Um, financially, it didn't make sense to us. Uh, you could call in and we could have your order ready. <laughs> um, but yeah, we tried to just keep it simple, do what we could. Um, and, and fortunately for us, the distribution side, so the brewery was still able to produce and distribute beer. So things pretty much functioned as normal in the back of the house. Um, and then we did what we could in the front. And then our food truck tried to stay open for to go. Uh, we did create an online ordering system. It never really took off. So we realized we had to change things up with the food truck at some point. And you were also doing food inside also, is that correct? In addition to the food truck? We were up until the 17th. Okay. And then it was just to go only. And that was perfect because it's a food truck. So there's a window, you can walk in or you can call in. Everything can be paid over the phone and then you can go. It just, I think when, when news first broke, people were so hesitant to continue as normal. So it, it, right. it just, yeah, it was, it, it, that was where it was tough for us to stay open. Yeah. So I had heard from other people in the community that you were somebody I absolutely had to interview because you guys did such an amazing creative pivot uh, during the course of all this COVID, you know, when everybody's making quick changes. So tell our listeners a little bit about how you guys pivoted. Uh, that was so amazing. So yeah, once we realized that it wasn't, um, I hate to say worth it, but it wasn't profitable to stay open for the food truck for to go. Um, our co-founder and owner, Tom Price, who used to do uh, operations for the uh, Presbyterian Church for their soup kitchen, he immediately said, there's a need. Unemployment numbers in this town are, are going up. The ski area had to close on the 14th. There's just a lot of people in an 
uncertain time. Um, and so we immediately started reaching out to potential community partners and local businesses and, and present them with this idea of we would provide free, mo free meals. And the goal was to provide 100 plus free meals a day um, from noon to five, seven days a week for as long as we could. Um, and the support we got was amazing. We have such a strong community um, and we had such support from several bi bigger businesses in town. And so we started April 10th, we launched, it was always a hundred. Some days Tom would do 130, 150 meals a day. And that went on through the 21st of May. And we provided over 6,000 meals in six weeks. Wow. All at no charge to anyone who needed. And by the term need, could have been the mom that worked all day and and had a need to provide for her kids and just needed a night off from cooking. I mean, the, we used the term need loosely because we wanted everyone to feel like it was for the community. It was our way to give back. Yeah, it just, it was amazing. And there was so much support from our customers coming in and saying, how can we help? What can we do? We started a GoFundMe page and we raised over $6,000 in about 10 days wow. from that, which allowed us to continue the program. Wow. Amazing. It was, it felt so good. It, it just, yeah, it was good. <laughs> yeah. Some, some really good news that comes out of a really terrible, challenging situation for all of us in, in the community. So thank you for doing that. That's incredible. So uh, Danielle, were you able to keep your own employees on the payroll because of the program that you did through the Soul Shack? So I believe it was the same week that the change was coming. Um, we, we were down employees for the Soul Shack. So we really only had one at the time. And then Tom was there seven days a week preparing and another employee. And they, they worked their tails off. They worked their tails off every day. But the good thing about it, it was um, a, a take and bake. So they could prep and cook all the meals ahead of time. And then they were prepackaged with a little sticker saying, you know, food temperature needed to reach this amount. And then people could cook it or could heat it at home. Mm -hmm. So they weren't cooking per order. Right. And so the reason why you did, why you only had one employee or you were down employees, was that because employees didn't feel safe coming in? Or what's the no. reason for that? Because everyone's talking about so much unemployment and people really need jobs. Tell me what happened there. No, so just um, in terms of, we, we opened the Soul Shack first of the year in January. I believe it was the third week in January. Um, and it was just the nature of hiring people and, and keeping staff on. It wasn't, it had nothing to do with safety. It just had to do with, it's tough to find people to work in a kitchen. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were lucky that we at least had the one. And then in the tasting room, we did, um, shortly after it was announced, no on premise, we had a meeting and we just, we got the feelings and emotions and needs of all the employees we had up, uh, in the front of house. Um, and it was determined to keep on myself as manager and one other employee. Um, and then we got on the PPP train right off mm -hmm. the bat. Right. So we could offer that to the employees to at least have that. But um, we don't, for the most part, aside from myself full time, the tasting room, the majority, uh, actually everybody is part time. Mm -hmm. so, so the so. folks that might not know, the PPP is the Paycheck Protection Program, and that was the SBA program that provided eight weeks of payroll support for businesses. So Danielle, in your situation, the PPP, well, you were the PPP recipient, your employees, <laughs> did they uh, stay home during that period and still receive a paycheck, or were you able to redeploy them somewhere else in the business? So what we thought was best is instead of having, keeping everybody on for one shift, we tried to minimize the employees coming and going. So we just kept on the two employees so we could minimize that. And myself and the other employee tried to have very little contact with anything outside of work and home. Um, and that was obviously for the safety of our own staff, the staff out back and the community. And then once we knew things were eventually going to change, we had another staff meeting to just get everyone. I mean, this whole thing has been an emotional roller coaster from day to day. Your feelings may change. So we had another meeting just to say who's ready to come back, who wants to come back. How do we now integrate you into this new system we have? Um, so about two weeks before 
we did open for on premise. We rotated everybody in for one shift so they could kind of see the new cleaning protocols and just get that anxiety over with, you know, get through that and realize that we're doing everything we can. We have, we have created a really, I think, comfortable environment where everyone can still enjoy that beer and feel comfortable. Yeah. So, yeah, so we tried to do it the right way and, and have everybody involved in, in the planning. Okay, so now you are back to on-premise dining, uh, and I'm glad that you mentioned that you had gone through some protocols with your staff. Uh, let's talk just a little bit about that, because I think a lot of business owners are still trying to wrap their head around what are the things they need to do in their business to make their uh, customers feel safe and secure, and also their employees safe and secure. I mean, I have to be honest, I've talked to some business owners where their employees did not want to come back to work. They would prefer to file for unemployment and stay home because they were scared. So tell me a little bit about some of the things you're doing at Soulcraft to create that sense of safety for both your employees and your customers. Our customers mean so much to us and our staff means so much to us. Every decision I, we made was about making our customer feel like we were looking out for them, for their family, for their friends. So first and foremost, no mask, no entry. And we had to enforce it. And I know at first everyone was a little uncomfortable because we're not, we don't want to police. We want, but at the same time, in order for everyone to have the best experience, we had to make sure everyone felt comfortable, you know? So that was the rule. And it was really great when Chafee County came out with their order that when you were going into a public space, you had to, because then on my nice little sign, I could put her order of Chafee County 2020-05 or whatever. Right. The <laughs> so that was great, because then we had that to fall back on. Um, and I would say 99% of people that came in complied whether we had to remind them and they ran out to their car and got their mask or whether they didn't come back. Right. It's okay because for the most part, the people that were in there appreciated the fact that we enforced it. So you just have to make a rule and stick to it. Um, and the other rules we, um, we did add a hand washing station. So right when you come in our double doors, there is a portable sink with water, a touchless soap and a touchless paper towel. Not mandatory, but if you want it, there it is. We have hand sanitizer uh, right at the, um, order here and obviously at the food truck. Um, it's a one in one out for our restroom. So there is a sign. We, um, in the women's room, we had three stalls. We took that down to just one, one sink. So we're trying to just minimize so we can effectively clean everything every 30 minutes. So bathroom door handles. If we can't have the doors to outside open, we're cleaning those. So every surface that gets touched gets cleaned every 30 minutes. It seems like a lot, but it honestly isn't. It seems like such a small price to pay to have people come in and enjoy and feel like we are looking out for them. Right. Um, so yes, I was out there with the tape measure on the patio, planning out the table placements. Um, another one of our rules is you can't touch the furniture. Like you can't rearrange our furniture. You know, if you're sitting at a table of four and another friend, a couple friends come over and want to join you, you can't move a chair from one place to another because now you're exceeding the six feet. Right. So it, if you want to enjoy a beer and not, and not put other people in a sense of discomfort. Right. And right. I know the theory is, well, if they're uncomfortable, they don't have to come, but let's instead say, how do we just make sure everyone's comfortable? Right. How do we keep how, everyone? How will you handle it when you have more capacity, when you have more <laughs> demand than capacity? Because I know you guys were doing some really great things in the community, like trivia night, where your place was packed. So have you thought about how you're going to uh, deal with too much demand and not enough capacity? Because you have to stay at 30%, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they expanded it to 50, but you have to maintain the six feet. So for us, in order for us to keep that, the flow of traffic coming in, ordering the beer and going out, it's hard for us to add more seats than that 30%. Um, we still will not allow anyone to sit at the bar uh, because obviously if the, ma the mask, once you sit down, you're free to take your mask off and enjoy. So great, if you have someone sitting at the bar without a mask and as a bartender, we're back and forth, that makes us feel not so safe. So we still have that blocked off. Um, and I have thought about how, how do we increase because I'm sure it's coming. 
and that's going to be challenging. I mean, unless the the six foot physical distancing is is changed, we we're at our max. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so one of the other questions that I get as an SBA consultant is around um, helping clients, helping business owners figure out some of their spreadsheet math. Uh, for example, you know, am I going to be able to sustain this business on 30% capacity? And I think some business owners haven't quite figured that out, or they're not really confident that once the PPP loan ends, that period where the government's assisting in which is coming up, cost, which <laughs> is this Friday. Yep. Um, are tell me a little bit about how you're feeling about taking that leap of. Um, not having the support of the PPP money and running a business on 30% capacity, what are some of the other things that you've done or what are you thinking about now that might help kind of other business owners sort of process how they're going to make that calculation? Well, again, we, we are very fortunate that we produce the goods we sell. So the labor cost is extremely low for us out front. Um, I have done staggered shifts, so there is some overlap. So if there is one person, but technically we can't be quote busy at the capacity we have right now. So that extra staggered person is just really to be a hostess per se, a host or hostess, just greeting everyone and making them feel like answering questions and kind of talking them through what, what we're enforcing. Um, so we just don't have the labor costs to have it hurt so much. Um, as, as long as we have people still feeling comfortable, and that's, that's the thing, like the more comfortable we can make our space, people will still come on to enjoy, and, and that's, we can handle the 30% because of the other avenues we have right now to, to produce uh, income. So we are very fortunate. And you'll continue to do the Soul Shack. Right now it's been converted back to a for-profit yes. provider, correct? Yes. Um, and, and we, again, we look at the menu items. We're trying to keep the cost low there. Um, don't have, we don't have a plate over $10. Uh, we still have the to-go. Everything is still served in a to-go container. Um, and actually it's done, it's done really well because it's an easy place to come get food grab a six pack and go. So you still have that nice to go option if you don't want to stay. Right, right. So. so tell our listeners a little bit about how they can learn more about what's on the menu. We haven't talked about what kind of food the Soul Shack produces. Maybe you can <laughs> mention that and uh, how they might uh, come in and enjoy the brew from Soul Craft. Tell us a little bit about what hours you're opened and how they can learn more. Yep, so the hours are always changing. <laughs> uh, we wanted to go back to normal hours and then we just realized that town is still pretty much shutting down at seven. Uh, so we're, we're noon to eight, six days a week, Sunday noon to seven, and the Soul Shack is open right now, seven days a week, noon to seven. Um, you can still get growler exchange program if you don't if you want to take your beer to go we have new growlers or you can bring in a glass soul craft growler um, and then we still have our six packs our tables are all space we're going to continue we've always had high cleanliness cleanliness standard standards um, and we will continue these exceeded standards for as long as we need to if not you know for the foreseeable for the foreseeable future um, you can always call in. We, 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 the online ordering didn't really take hold, uh, but if people are more comfortable, they can of course call in. We can take your order over the phone and it can be ready for you. Um, yeah, I mean, we have a beautiful sun covered patio. Again, everything is spaced out and we are enforcing our rules for the safety of our community and staff, so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Danielle DeForest, thank you so much for all your time today. I really appreciate learning more about what Soulcraft did to pivot during the COVID crisis. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, hopefully we'll see you over there soon. Yes. Thank you very much.